Hello. How are we doing? Hope we're doing good. Hope you had a good Easter break. Um, this week, I, let's see here. I've already sent out um, a to-do list for this week. So hopefully you've all seen that soonish by the time this I put this up. And um, hopefully I'm going to get two lectures up. I'm going to be doing uh, chapter, what is it? Yeah, chapter 52. Uh, this lecture is going to be introduction to ecology and then chapter 53, uh, population ecology next. So that's what we're going to be doing. There we go. Okie dokie. So let's go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be talking about ecology. So um, ecology is basically taking everything we've learned about so far through last semester and this semester and putting it together. Basically, ecology is the study of the interactions of living organisms with their environment. So this is pulling from pretty much every layer of biology we've kind of... Um, and all over the place. So basically one of the goals of ecology is understanding the distribution and abundance of, li of living things in their physical environment. Why, you know, how are they living? How are they living, you know, um, in their area? Um, you know, how has the land changed them? How have they changed to adapt to where they've been living? You know, so I, and, and how that's caused animals to change over time. It's it's a big, very, very broad science. So, you know, ecology is is very broad. We're looking at big pictures. Now, there are levels to ecology. Some of this we've already touched on a little bit um, in like past semester and bio 111 and now in this semester bio 112. So there are levels of ecological organization. So uh, you can go from the individual and just looking at, you know, that layer and then looking at a population, which is actually what we're going to talk about in the next lecture is population. Um, and then community, how these, you know, how these individuals in a population basically interact with other living organisms in their environment, how they cohabitate and, you know, the food webs, all that fun stuff. Um, and then you can look at the overall ecosystem of how all these different populations all live in this one area and um, how that ecosystem can change depending on what's going on with certain factors, whether it be biotic, which are living things, or abiotic, which is non-living things like the weather. Um, and then you could look at it all together into this one big one called the biosphere. Um, Monty's trying to leave. There you go. So. Now, there are different, this is kind of where uh, biology and um, earth sciences kind of merge as well. You're going to see a lot of uh, talking about a abiotic factors as we're moving on through this. So, again, just to go over the different levels here. So, organ uh, organismal ecology. So, this is basically uh, individuals. Uh, interested in adaptations that enable individuals to live in specific habitats. These adaptations could be morphological, physiological, or behavioral. Uh, population ecology. So this is a group of interbreeding organisms uh, that are members of the same species living in the same area at the same time. And um, so organisms that are all members of the same species are called consp uh, consp specifics. Con specifics, yes. So if you were talking about all the humans in Hendersonville, we would be con specifics. Oof, I'm having a hard time saying that today. Sorry about that. Um, so a population is identified in part where it lives and area of its population, and it may have natural or artificial boundaries. And some of those artificial boundaries are things that we humans have built in place. Like you wouldn't think of some of these things as uh, boundaries, but uh, highways are actually a boundary. Um, putting up those huge walls for soundproofing. I'm sure you've seen them. If you've seen, I know they're putting up ones around the I-26 Hendersonville exit. But you'll notice every so often they put a break in those. They're not a full wall. That's so uh, animals can get around them. Yeah, we had to learn the hard way when we were putting up those soundproofing walls 
so that way a community doesn't get to listen to you know the sound the the loving sounds of i-26 uh so uh yeah we've had to put breaks there's actually other ones we've done to try and stop some artificial boundaries um we've actually made land bridges over highways so the creatures could literally have this safe zone to go over these bridges they're not they're not for people it's literally just for animals to walk over so um we'll go into some of those a little later they're kind of interesting so we've we've tried to fix nat uh artificial boundaries where we can and like i was showing you last time with uh, the fish uh you know our favorite uh fish uh launcher system the whoosh that's one because dams are artificial boundaries that was messing with the salmon population and other fish uh quite a bit until we figured out you know how to make ladders for them and then now we're using the whoosh system where we put them in a thing and go like thunk. So, you know, what you do with your fish? Launch them into upstream. Anyway, community ecology. So this is biological community consists of uh, different species within an area, usually a three-dimensional space, and these interactions among these species. So we're usually looking at interactions, uh, you know, what drive the interactions, you know, prey, predator, food web stuff. Um, also study interactions between various species. Uh, members of different species are called heterospecifics. And examples of heterospecific interactions are like predation, you know, you know, coyote eat rabbit, uh, parasitism, uh, like we talked about tapeworms. Um herbivory uh competition uh pollination uh mutualism yeah we really have to study pollination a lot especially right now with a lot of our pollinators just up and dying on us yeah we have to be very very careful um and this is something we're major studying right now because without a lot of these pollinators we don't get crops and that's not good especially since we're in a very ag agricultural yeah, I can't speak today. Your tire gets blown out and first thing in the morning and you can't speak words. Oh, no. Anyway, so, yeah, getting back to that, you know, we're in a very, very ag agricultural. Why am I saying agricultural? That doesn't even make sense. Agricultural heavy area. You know, especially here in Hendersonville. You know, pollination is a major factor in farming when you're working with plants so gotta be careful now pollinators are good like i said a couple lectures ago it isn't just you know the pollinators it's like oh save the honeybees yeah i get that but our native pollinators are under uh attack right now too and we need them just as much if not more as you know the honeybees which is you know been coming with humans since we figured out how to put them in hives and move them around with us the european honeybee is one of our favorites to drag around along with cats rats and dogs anyway so uh mutualism this is a form of long-term relationship that is co-evolved between two species which benefit from each other and you see this a lot um in different biomes that we're going to be covering today, especially tropical biomes. I mean, any biome, really. There's usually uh, two species that are living together. Like, again, talking about pollinators, there are some hummingbirds that only, you know, can drink and get food from a certain type of flower in, in the tropics. And unfortunately, though, if, uh, yeah, the flower dies, that means the hummingbirds die and vice versa as well, because these flowers have co-evolved to use the hummingbird as pollinators. So the hummingbird pollinates the flowers for the flowers and the hummingbird, you know, gets its food only from those flowers. And then if one of them dies off, the other one will follow, unfortunately. That's the great thing about mutualism and the bad thing about mutualism. It's like you have a guaranteed co-relationship forever and ever, but until, unless one of the species dies and then you're both, 
Yeah, so there's a lot of mutualism going on. Um, we're going to see that quite a bit as we go along. Uh, ecosystem ecology. So this is an extension of organismal population and community ecology. And basically, this is where we look at the things that are living versus the things that are non-living. So the biotic versus the abiotic and how that uh, interacts to make life possible in these areas and how the life has adapted to the abiotic conditions. So some abiotic components include air, water, soil. Uh, there's going to be two that you're going to like. I mean, when I get videos up and everything, um, you're going to see this often over and over again. There's two that really rule ecosystem ecology over and over uh, of the abiotic factors. And I'll get to that in just a second. So the spheres of the earth. So remember, the earth is, yes... Actually, we're not even round. Did you know that the Earth is actually fatter around the equator than it is around the north-south? It's because of the way we spin. So, yeah, Earth's got more uh, junk in her trunk than she does the other way. Just a fun fact. Anyway, um, so because of that, we still split out uh, different layers. or It's hard to say layers because they're very much interconnected. So we kind of split them out. So like the geosphere, it's made up of the lithosphere and all the uh, rock and all the... Uh... Hi, Monty. He's being very active today. Are you hungry? Okay. Maybe he's hungry. I hope so. So anyway, um, so the geosphere, it's made up of tons of stuff uh basically doing with tech plate tectonics uh minerals rocks rock formation the rock cycle all this fun stuff so you will trust me he we talk about him especially with it's like some of the different uh cycles like the carbon cycle and whatnot and that will come up in the future uh, next up, of course, is the hydrosphere. This is dealing with all the water on planet Earth. When, and, and if you recall, Earth is about 71% water. So that's that's a lot of water. That's a lot of damp water. Um, so that's, um, you know, the salt water and the uh, fresh water and the in-betweens. There are in-between areas. And we're going to talk about that, too. Uh, we're going to be talking about the biomes in a minute. And the biomes, there's terrestrial biomes, and then there's water biomes. So there are different biomes even within uh, our water systems. So life is everywhere. And then the biosphere is all the living things on the planet. And then the atmosphere is all the, uh, all the uh, gas pocket that we live in that protects us, A, from the radiation. So that way the sun is not a deadly laser and we don't go, oh God, when we walk outside and burst into flames, because that would be bad. Now, um, some you, if you look at the spheres of the earth online, you're going to get a whole bunch. Some people like to split out the lith uh, the geosphere and the lithosphere from each other. There is a, there is a difference um, that geologists love and biologists are like, that's nice. Um, and some people split out like all the frozen water, which is the cryosphere. So yeah, which is interesting because um, if you if you take all the water in the world, uh, ninety seven percent is salt water. The other three percent is fresh, but two percent of that is frozen, and then one percent is available to use which is insane how much water is on our planet that is absolutely unusable and granted there are um we do have actual plants there are countries that actually have salinity uh plants that are next to the ocean and actually pump out you know salt on one end and fresh water on the other hand uh, other end for the their countries so there are ways to get you know fresh water from the ocean we have these abilities but it's easier just to go and use what we've got already with the water cycle and whatnot. We'll get into the water cycle in a bit. We're going to touch on some of the cycles super quick. But like I said, this is an intro chapter and whatnot. And then we'll move in and get a little deeper down into some of this stuff. So what runs ecology? Well, basically there's two things. And then there's the big two. The big two that we're going to talk about over and 
over and over. So again, as I mentioned earlier, abiotic factors, these are non-living things. A means no, bio means life. So no life factors. And that is non-living things like water, temperature, how much sunlight are you getting? Stuff like that. Stuff that, you know, it's a little hard to control. And then there's biotic factors. Bio means living. So living things. Now, over and over again, the two major abiotic factors. Now, uh, your book lists four, uh, when, especially when it's talking about climate. But honestly, the more you're going to read these chapters and you're going to see these videos and whatnot, you're going to see over and over again, it's water and temperature, water and temperature, water and temperature. These are the two things that pretty much dictate what's going on in every biome what makes the biomes really different from each other and how life reacts to these two things. So really the limiters on this, on life on planet is water and temperature. We're gonna keep coming back to this over and over. So these two bad boys of the abiotic factors are your main culprits for pretty much running ecology. So let's talk about climate a little bit. So. Climate is a long-term prevailing weather conditions conditions in the given area. Again, water and temperature. As you can see right here, what's the first two of your book lists? Temperature, precipitation, bang. Also, they put in sunlight and wind. Um, and interestingly enough, sunlight actually drives wind. We're going to uh, sort of kind of touch on that a little bit. I'm not going to go too crazy about it. Um, Monty, though, is wiggling away from me. Come on, man. Help me here. So, uh, so things that affect climate, like seasons. Uh, because the Earth is tilted on an axis, we're, we're tilty. Not, all, not only are we chubby across the equator, we're also very tilty. And depending on where we are, um, each hemisphere has a different season. We're actually kind of inversed. So like, for instance, in December, because we're pointed away from the sun, we're not getting as much direct sunlight at the northern hemisphere. So therefore, we're in winter. However, the southern hemisphere is pointing towards. So the southern hemisphere is actually having summer. So yeah, the land down under is on an inverse from those of us here in North America, which is kind of cool. Um, and again, uh, so around March, so they're experiencing fall on the southern equator and we're experiencing spring and then we go to uh, summer in june again we're pointing towards the sun the uh us upper half the northern hemisphere yeah northern hemisphere so the northern hemisphere is having summer well because the southern hemisphere is pointing away they're having winter so yeah if you go down during the summer and fly down to australia bring a coat they're having winter and then again, so we're on the other side and in September. So we're we're having experiencing fall because we're starting to point more and more away from the sun and they're experiencing spring. So that's because, and that, you know, is a huge thing. And not all, you know, not all areas too, because depending on where they're pointing, have a true four seasons. There are some places that literally just have two seasons, especially around the equator. They have rainy season, and not rainy season. So that's literally their two seasons, rainy season and dry season. Um, for those of us on the Northern Hemisphere, some places do have an actual four seasons, like we do. We actually here enjoy a nice four seasons. Um, you don't see that everywhere. So seasons are, you know, depending on where you are on the planet. So the traditional four seasons that we're all, you know, taught and whatnot, not everywhere on the planet experiences that. And some places just get rainy season, dry season. Some places just get six months of night and six months of day, which is especially right here at the top. Um, so it depends entirely on what's going on with that. So uh, bodies of water. Uh, this goes back to why water is so crazy important. And it was uh, a thing I kind of do, and I'm not sure uh, if the professor before me did that too. But um, 
so are you last professor but why is water so important well one of the reasons water is so crazy important is because it acts like a heat sink um have you ever stood there watching a you know a pot going when is this thing going to boil well that's called specific heat and that's how much uh, energy it takes to raise a gram of a substance one degree celsius and every uh, material out there has a different type of specific heat, how much it can absorb. Water has a very uh, interesting specific heat in the fact that it um, can absorb quite a lot. And because of that, large bodies of water absorb, takes a long time to heat up and a long time to cool down. And this affects our weather, especially on the coast, uh, next to oceans, or next to large bodies of water like the Great Lakes. So for instance, because the ocean, say the Atlantic, um, if you ever wonder why it's cooler on the coast than it is you know, up in the mountains during the summer, relatively speaking, or on the Piedmont there, uh, the reason being is because if you're on the coast, um, over the summer, the ocean is sucking in heat, sucking in heat, sucking in heat. So the coast is actually quite cooler than it would be, say, in the Piedmont uh, during the summer. Now, because, you know, the ocean sucks in the heat, sucks in the heat, sucks in the heat all uh, year or all summer, and then suddenly it gets to release that heat in the winter. And that's why, again, on the coast, the weather is milder because um, during the winter, the ocean is there releasing the heat from the summer, releasing, releasing, releasing slowly, slowly. And therefore you have more mild temperatures along coasts than you do further inland. Mountains kind of do the same thing. Mountains can redirect water. There's the front of the mountain and the lee side of a mountain range. The front side usually is the one that gets all the rain and whatnot. And the lee side, because clouds are heavy and it rain, it's going to dump all that water before it tries to go over a mountain. Um, and, you know, depending on the, which way the wind's going, keep in mind, it isn't like clouds are planning on it. They're just going wherever the wind takes them. So anyway, and on the lee side, doesn't get as much water because it's usually rained on the one side and not a lot of rain is getting to the other side because of this exact thing. You know, rain crowds are heavy. They're going to dump everything and then maybe float over the mountain. And if they've got anything left, yeah, maybe. Like our mountains, we don't have too much of a lee side because our mountains are very small because they're ancient. Our mountains are the oldest mountains in the world. Um, they saw dinosaurs. Where our youngins out west, the Rockies, they're youngins. They're newish. That's why they're so tall. Same thing with uh, the Himalayas. The reason they're so tall, the Alps, because they're rather newish. The older the mountain, the more worn down it is. Kind of like teeth. So anyway, so you know, um, and you can definitely see that more in like the Rockies, the the you know the 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 rain side, the lee side. So um, not so much here because it doesn't take too much effort to get over the mountains. I know I've been stuck in a thunderstorm on top of a mountain once. Not a good place to experience a thunderstorm because it's in your face. Don't do that. Uh, vegetation. Uh, different vegetation can actually influence the climate of an area. Um, the tropics is a good example because if you clear cut out the tropics, the that changes the climate in that area big time. Also, there's things called microclimates. So microclimates are climates within a climate. And for instance, it's like the inside of a log rotting. That could be a microclimate. Um all sorts of like tiny areas that are kind of like encapsulated. So there's like, there is a thing as a microclimate inside of a larger climate, depending on what's going on. Now, biogeography is the study of the geographic distribution of living things and the abiotic factors that affect their distribution. So again, temperature, rainfall, um and these things can change and when these things change the plants and the animals also have to change with that to survive so 
Um, usually we, you know, study biogeography with examining patterns of species distribution. So an endemic species is one that's naturally found in a specific area. For instance, those flowers and those hummingbirds, I said, they're mutualistic, they can't live without each other. Um, that would be an example of an endemic species. You can only find them in that one place and that's in the tropics. However, other species are generalists. They can live pretty much anywhere. Um, the king of all the generalists are, of course, the water bears, the tardigrades, because they're everywhere. And um, another good generalist, uh, for instance, possums. Possums are everywhere. Um, yeah, there's a lot that we've drug around ourselves or have decided to hitch rides with us. Rats. Australia is not a big fan of cats because unfortunately cats came through and destroyed a lot of their biome because we were just like, let's bring our cats and then let's not get them fixed. And the reason, always get your cats fixed because holy cow, they make up a ton of kids. And unfortunately, it we it, kitchen season is upon us again. So yeah, always get your cats fixed. It's better. And Monty's never been fixed because he's still a virgin. Yeah. And he I don't think he knows, so shh, don't tell him. Anyway, um, so where does all the energy come from to run the world? Well, there's technically two places. The sun is the big one. The sun is we couldn't survive without the sun. So yay, sun. So the sun is where we get all the energy. Now the Earth's core is actually the second place we get energy, and that's usually, that's what's driving all our plate tectonics, that's what's driving um, our magnosphere, that's what's dra driving a lot of things that protect us from space. So our core actually does protect us as well and give us energy. So we do have two places. I know, you know, everybody's like, oh, the sun, but we do have a second place. That's the Earth's core, because it is spinning. Um, our core actually is two pieces now it could be more um they're always doing some new cool research about it that i haven't caught up with uh so basically we have an inner core and an outer core and what happens is it's really psychotically hot dense metals uh the densest of them all the metals that is collected in the middle of the planet and they they basically go around each other and because of that we are a giant electromagnet because that's what an electromagnet is it's usually one magnet spinning one way and the another magnet spinning in the opposite way and that's how you make electricity well our planet does it and that's how we have a north and a south pole that's magnetically act that's actually magnetic there's only one other planet in our solar system that has that capability and that is interestingly mercury mercury has its own magnetosphere nobody else does nobody else has that no other planet in our solar system is a magnet like us and mercury now that it's helping Mercury any, because he's you know right next door to the sun, kind of. Um, everybody else does not have this ability. So now, so basically, energy from the sun is captured by green plants, algae, cyanobacteria, photosynthesis, protists. These organisms convert solar energy into chemical energy. Uh, and then, which is in turn stored in two things we've talked about in the past, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is the short term um, kind of way to do that. And then the long term, which is uh, usually in the form of glucose, fructose, sucrose, and then fat, if you have too much of it, not that plants really do that. But then we take it and we eat it, and then we take it and do it in reverse, where we take the... Uh, you know, glucose and break it down and turn it back into ATP. And if we eat too much of it, then we turn it into fat and stick it on our thighs. Yeah. Anyway, so light availability can be very important. And um, you're going to see that when we talk about the ocean and the ocean layers. <laughs> the ocean has many, many layers, and it's all really on light. Um, light does not get down to the bottom of the ocean. Only in the most shallow areas do you see that. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, ocean's crazy. 
so they live they do something else they're uh, they're still eating that delicious chemical soup that's coming up out of the uh, earth's crust so which is actually really cool so we'll, we'll get into that in a bit oh like right now ha 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 in aquatic ecosystems availability light is limited because sunlight is absorbed by water and plants at the bottom can't get it so there's literally a sunlight zone and then after that it's just dark 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 darkest so towards the bottom of a lake a pond or an ocean especially an ocean um there's a zone that just light cannot get to and it's because most of the wavelengths except for blue are the shortest uh and absorbed by the water column so that's why it kind of gets bluer as you go down because blue is like the one getting down there the furthest but even he gives out after a while um so photosynthesis can't happen there um as a result there's a lot of weird adaptations that uh have evolved with the life living there including like i said delicious chemical soup coming out of these vents and these vents are kind of like especially way down in the midnight zone and whatnot these are like islands because uh life without these life can't really live down there so uh there are some creatures that can go from bit to bit to bit but the smaller creatures they stay here this is their whole world is this event and the area around the vent and that's it that's their world they can't travel to another vent because who god knows how long that other vent might be that far away they don't know i mean if you were living here and you only knew that, and would you swim off into the pitch black darkness to go find another vent that may or may not be out there? Yeah, kind of, kind of weird to think about. I'm almost like an analogy of planets in space. Anyway, except it's at the bottom of our ocean. Crazy. Aren't you glad you're on the surface, Monty? He said yes. All right, so now gravity still works. Um, and nutrients in aquatic systems is actually really important. So usually, all right, say, you know, a whale dies. And what's it going to do? It's going to sink to the bottom of the ocean. Now, there's energy found in that, you know, dying and whatnot but unfortunately we don't want it to settle all right what i'm trying to say is this you know if everything dies then how do nutrients get you know back up again from being trapped at the bottom of the ocean then all nutrients would be trapped at the bottom of the ocean right right well there's something called ocean upwelling which is basically the rising of deep ocean waters when prevailing winds blow across the surface of the ocean and it causes basically a whole churning of the ocean. And this is a good thing because it unsettles all the stuff on the bottom to be reused by other living organisms as it comes up, you know, with these upwellings. So the wind going across the surface of the ocean actually causes the ocean to churn and actually we get currents because of this too. And currents are extremely important for moving all of this around, which is why we have things like the Gulf Stream and and stuff like that. So that, and whales follow it. You'll notice that, you know, a lot of the streams, a lot of life follows because the streams are basically where all the nutrients that have been just hanging out at the bottom of the ocean are getting riled up and moved through these streams and all the creatures move through you know using that that uh, energy from the dead organisms to recapture it and turn it into you know food again for the whole uh, bottom of the ecosystem up on into you know all up the way all the way up into whales you know filter feeders stuff like that so it's it's a whole so the wind actually stirs up the ocean and a lot of lakes we're going to get into that in a minute so that way you know all the the wonderful nutrients isn't just hanging out the bottom of the ocean forever and ever with the titanic although the titanic is also disintegrating they say about 10 years it's got 10 years left before it completely collapses um there are actually bacteria they call it the, those rust sickles that are coming off that's actually the bacteria eating the iron that it's made up of yum 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 um fun fact uh calcium is interestingly at a premium in the ocean so usually if something dies um 
it actually goes it gets uh decomposed a whole lot faster in the ocean than it does in um on land so you know you need to get rid of bodies but half the problem is just getting out to the ocean in the first place the fbi kind of you know tracks boats and things so. but yeah that's the reason why you haven't found any bodies on the titanic uh because calcium was at a premium those bodies went those bodies disintegrated fast uh even down there so the uh living creatures recycle calcium pretty quick so um yeah it's a great way to get rid of bodies bad way um you know getting it to the ocean in the first place that's where you're gonna get caught not that I know that or anything. Not that I know the, you know. No, no, no. I've never had to get rid of bodies. Yeah. Uh, where was I? So anyway, yeah. That and water is a another fun fact about water: major dissolver. Even us humans, it just regular water, it will dissolve given enough time. That's why, uh, unfortunately, bodies that been drowned or whatnot or hung been thrown in the water for a while they don't look so good because water will help with the breaking down pretty well anyway so again freshwater systems have the recycling of nutrients as well in response to air temperature and wind changes so the nutrients at the bottom of lakes are recycled twice a year and this is called spring and fall turnovers and so it's a it's a seasonal process uh that recycles nutrients and oxygen from the bottom um, to the top of the lake. And these turnovers are caused by the thermocline. These are layers of, of uh, temperatures that are significantly different from those above and below. So what's happening, again, when I was talking about earlier, and this is kind of what I was talking about, is, uh, you know, the sun hits the water, the water starts heating up. And again, it takes a long time for water to heat up. Again, if you've ever stood there really, really bored and really, really hungry waiting for a pot of uh, water to boil, you know what I'm talking about. So that's what's going on right here is that we've got this thing called the thermocline. So we've got the warm water and the cool water and there's stratification across the both because the, the warm water is warm and the cool water is down here. Remember, warm air or, and same thing with water warm rises cold sinks and that causes these guys to actually kind of have a bit of a flow now this causes these turnovers because it will flip-flop so the warm water and the cold water will flip-flop and it causes the turnover and therefore the nutrients during spring turnover and fall turnover um get stirred up in a lake and therefore you know the oxygen and the nutrients get redistributed so that way creatures can continue living in there um winter stratification is basically water below is near 32 degrees and water above the sediments is near 39 degrees fahrenheit still not happy but this is where a lot of creatures go like amphibians and whatnot to go bury themselves and sleep for the winter or go into hibernation for the winter because it's a bit warmer at the bottom again remember water heats up slowly and releases heat slowly so all that summer heat you know kind of near the bottom so that's the turnover it that this is what keeps um you know the water cycling in um lakes and what lakes and whatnot yes all right so again temperature changes the physiology of organisms as well as the density and state of water so again remember the two biggies temperature and water temperature and water temperature and water that's pretty much what drives all of ecology and yeah i, I warned you before i'm going to talk about a lot and we still are so anyway so uh very few things can survive temperatures below 32 degrees fahrenheit due to metabolic constraints i know i showed you those uh wood frogs that can freeze because they kind of make uh an antifreeze chemical in their blood um but there comes a point where they just can't anymore it, whether it be you know again the freezing and the water expanding like i said if you stick a water bottle in the freezer and the bottom pops out you know water expands this is literally what destroys boulders um 
given enough time. And um, same thing here. Water expands, it bursts all your cell membranes. And after a while, yeah, you're going to destroy whatever, you know, water-based system you have because water's going to do what water's going to do. It's also rare for uh, living things to survive temperatures exceeding 113 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is a reflection of Earth's uh, evolutionary responses to uh, near the Earth's surfaces. So enzymes are most efficient within a very narrow range. We talked about you know, um, well, last semester. Enzymes have one job. They're really good at it as long as they have that perfect temperature that they work at because anything more you cook it or denature it where it falls apart. Remember an enzyme shape equals its job. If it can't keep its shape, it can't do its job. It's kind of like us, you know, if we don't feel good or, you know, your arm falls off, you can't do your job anymore because your arm fell off. Same thing with enzymes, except they're very dependent on temperature, not their arms falling off. Um, so there's a specific range of temperatures. Um, enzyme degradation can occur at higher temperatures, which is called denaturing, where it just falls apart. This is why we cook our food, because we like to kind of pre-denature it so we don't have to spend as long digesting it. Yay! Yeah, that's where that uh, the liver king is wrong. Eating raw meat doesn't do anything for us because we've actually evolved to eat uh, cooked food. Actually, that's why our intestines are a lot shorter than a lot of other animals, because we've already pre-cooked it. We don't have to spend as much time digesting it and pulling out all the nutrients because we kind of did a little bit. Head we did some pre-work, except for steaks. It's just, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't mean it needs to be, you know, raw, but what is it that, that. Yeah, from what is it? No, my brain just said Family Guy was not like King of the Hill. You know, what if we? What if somebody asks for above a medium rare? We politely but firmly ask them to leave. <laughs> I had a I had a principal who uh, uh, ate his steaks well done. I'm like, Ugh. anyway, but always make sure your cooking uh, your chicken is cooked all the way right. Because salmonella, not fun. And the crazy part is, Monty here has salmonella naturally on his skin. A lot of reptiles do. But luckily, I give Monty a bath every so often. Not like a crazy bath. Or just, you know. Yeah. So don't lick snakes. Now, I hope you weren't planning on it. I'm just letting you know. Natural salmonella on snake. Don't lick snakes. Thank you. And wash your hands afterwards. I do. Anyway. So. Where was I? Oh yeah, enzymes. So anyway, um, so they have to either maintain an internal temperature, like us and birds, we have, um, you know, we're endothermic, we maintain our own body heat, which is why we have to actually eat three times a day. Uh, same thing with birds, and now my snake is going up my sleeve because he is exothermic. So he doesn't have to eat three times a day um, because he doesn't maintain an internal temperature. He waits for the, uh, the environment to do it for him. So well, they have to in inhabit an environment that will keep our body within a temperature that supports our metabolism, all our enzymes to keep working, to keep us alive. And that is homeostasis, the name of the game of living, keeping things in the same inside so we can tolerate the differences outside and not drop dead. So, yeah. So that's why Monty has heating pads in his tank and whatnot, because he has to live because he's an exotherm and we're endotherm. All right. So how do we deal with uh, climate and whatnot as living creatures? We're going to talk more about this in the next lecture, but I'm going to go with it right now. So how we deal with it. Uh, migration is one way. It's a regular movement from one place to another. Uh, that happens all the time. I mean, you can see it happen in humans. Let's look back to Hurricane Katrina. That's, I mean, that's, you know, not a recent one, but it is one. A ton of people got displaced because of that. Not everybody went back. A lot of people, you know, moved. A lot of people are still living in places like Texas and whatnot. And a ton of people came up into North Carolina too. 
so you know even humans uh if something messes up you can't live where you were because your home is been destroyed or something like that people have to move you got to go you know find a home find work it's not just animals so like there's a forest fire yeah all the deer run away and they have to go figure out somewhere else to live and the same thing with birds and squirrels and plant well plants some plants actually like to be on fire uh, a lot of the scrub brush out in california is actually designed to be on fire um because their seeds are actually uh germinated by the fire or not germinated but oh what's the word i'm looking for the seeds actually will not be viable unless they're roasted so some of the plants out in california are very much dependent on seasonal wildfires now we've aggravated the systems out there so that's why we have crazy wildfires out there it has nothing to do with raking uh has everything to do with that's naturally how it is those those uh those plants out there propagate by fire um the whole ecosystem actually deals with fire uh, as part of the ecosystem and fortunately like i said because people want nice pretty green lawns and stuff like that which is as you can tell i'm not the biggest fan of mowing lawns but at the same time i'm also not one of those people it's like yes have a wonderful natural lawn because that's called i have ticks all over my legs now there's a happy balance and anyway so but you know there's that that american dream of having the, the the beautiful lawn with the white picket fence and blah 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 um but so unfortunately you know that's what they tried to do out in an area that is basically a burn zone you know the whole ecosystem is literally a burn zone so brilliant uh dispersible so this is movement of individuals or gametes away an area of high population or their area of origin um like what's happening right now with the pollen yay pollen uh plants are releasing all their pollen which is their gametes away so that way they pollinate and hopefully you know settle somewhere else this is basically how po plants took over the world um before the insects popped up and said hey this place is nice and then you know millions of years later we uh you know the first you know fish with legs and lungs walked up and said this is nice so <laughs> yeah insects beat us to the plants beat everybody to the punch and terraform the planet insects beat everybody to the everybody to what the plants had made and that's why they got huge for a while um and then you know the uh, vertebrates came up later going oh this is nice and the insects are like where, where have you been anyway so anyway uh hibernation in cold environments i know everybody thinks bears interestingly bears are not true hibernators they don't true hibernate they kind of like semi hibernate um however they do eat a bunch of stuff and make a a plug for their own rear end and they have to pass that when they wake up so that way they don't have to poop while they're sleeping can you imagine you have to eat a whole bunch of pine cones and things to plug up your intestines? Fun. And passing that in the spring. No wonder they're grumpy when they wake up. I would be too. If I had to pass a plug made of pine cones. Ugh. Again, aren't you glad you're human? Um, estivation. This is in uh dry, hot environments. Basically, animals that hibernate or estivate or go into a state known as torpor uh and monty can do that too uh, a lot of snakes do during the winter if you ever wonder what the heck snakes do during the winter they actually find pockets uh usually underground uh and you'll see sometimes you'll find these pockets and it's a whole bunch of different snake species that just get together and pass out no they are not interbreeding god i used to hear that at the zoo all the time black snakes are mating with with you know wah -ba -dah -ba. no they're not anyway mm, moving on no they're not they can't it's it's like your bird having relationship with a, sl a slug it just they have different sexual things so they can't really yeah they're both snakes but yeah it's not it's not gonna work 
Anyway, it just doesn't work. They just nap together over the winter. Anyway, so they go in the torpor together. Um, and the, usually the metabolic rate is very much lowered. Um, this basically lets the animal wait until the environment better to support survival uh, so they can survive on less resources because there are no resources or it's just too cold for them to their uh, their uh, metabolic. Um, mm -hmm. Come on, I can say words. Yeah, metabolism to actually function like Monty. If he gets below 60, he actually will go into torpor and anything below that could actually kill him. So that's why he's... That's so why he's got heating pads and heating lamps to keep him nice and warm so he can be a happy boy and keep his enzymes happy so he doesn't die. That was the best song ever. No. All right. So water again. So we just talked about temperature. Let's talk about water. So water is required by all living things because we're made of water and we need it for our cellular processes. How many times do we talk about water? A lot. And so anyway, uh, since terrestrial organisms lose water to the environment, we've got to retain water. We don't want to dry out like a frog walking across a parking lot. And then you got a frog jerky thing there. Anyway, so plants, again, we talked about this back in the plants. They have waxy cuticles and stomas or stomatas, so that way they can open and close their stomatas uh, to conserve or, you know, let out water depending on what's going on. Animals, we have scales, like Monty. Uh, we don't, but Monty has scales, don't you, Monty? Yep. And um, skin and pores. That's why um, our pores open up. So uh, when we get hot, although not everybody's got that adaptation. For instance, like we sweat and stuff like that, and our pores open up. And dogs and cats and a lot of other animals, they have to pant because they don't exactly sweat like we do. So their only way to get it out is through their tongues. And so again, other plant adaptations, uh, they're very, uh, you know, in, in like, for instance, very, very, uh, in, in the deserts, they have very shallow roots that go out over a long distance uh, to uh, soak up the water over a large area, but they don't go very, um, uh, and some of them have very deep roots that go, uh, get to the water to store underground. Um, no leaves, again, this is why, uh, pine needles are really just modified leaves technically everything on a plant that isn't a stem is a modified leaf petals modified leaf um prickers modified leaf um pretty much the whole reproductive system of the plant modified leaf it's all just really a modified leaf uh so plants learn to modify their leaves in all sorts of which ways um Photosynthesis and stems because of the no leaves. Uh, flowers open at night when it's cooler. Uh, so that way pollinators will are more likely to be out at night as well. So therefore they're banking on it's too hot during the day for the pollinators to be working. So therefore they open up at night when the pollinators actually are doing their, are actually, you know, surviving during the cooler temperatures in the night. Animal adaptations. You have huge ears, especially that, that's actually literally to, uh, release heat energy from the body. So it's not only for hearing, it's also a, a, a temperature regulator. So if you ever wondered why, you know, jackrabbits out in the, you know, have huge ears, um, it's actually to uh, lose more body heat. Uh, they have, they urinate very little to save water. Uh, behavioral, they're usually more active in the twilight and night than they are during the day. Uh, so that's where you see most of the activity happening in a uh, desert. So again, we have all sorts of different ways, as I was talking about, you know, in the last couple of lectures is, you know, hello, uh, we have to, uh, you know, life. I was going somewhere with that. My thought train just derailed. Come back. Remember, we have to, you know, take the ocean with us. That was one of the things we had to figure out. If we wanted to leave the ocean that we're so dependent on, we kind of had to take it with us and we can't lose it. So we've got to have ways to not lose, not, not dry out. And we came up with different ways of doing that. You know, reptiles have scales. We have skin with pores. Yep. Moving on. So, um, 
So temperature, moisture, important things. So this basically uh, influences plant production, which is called primary productivity. Um, and that gives us the amount of organic matter available as food, which is net primary productivity. And this is an estimation of all the organic matter available as food. It's calculated as a total amount of carbon fixed per year minus the amount that's oxidized during cellular respiration. So when that's being ingested by herbivores or then again, when, you know, predators are eating it. Um, in terrestrial environments, uh, the primary productivity is basically biomass. So the total mass of everything that's living on the, on the land, excluding the roots, which is weird because roots are kind of really difficult to measure their mass i i know it's like but i can measure a carrot and a carrot's a big root yeah it's it's one of those weird technical things because if you think about it what is a root a root is not only trying to absorb things out of um um uh, with the help of fungi all the minerals and whatnot in the water and the soil but it's also where the plant stores a lot of its reserves of everything, which varies greatly between plant species. And like I said, there's some there's some species that they have, we use their roots to eat, like carrots and turnips and everything else. It's a tuber. And potatoes? No, potato is a... Yeah. Anyway, moving on, sorry. And um, so it just depends. Uh, and basically, net productivity is basically variable. Uh, and very productive biomes have a very high level of above ground biomass, like a tropics. Tropics have tons. We're going to get into that in a minute. So there's other factors that basically we're going to get into this later. I'm going to go over it like super fast here in just a second. So you got the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the water cycle, and the oxygen cycle, because all of these are getting moved around, moved around, moved around, moved around in the system, as I was saying e earlier. So anyway, biomes. And yes, I did put in the Minecraft biomes right here. Anyway, a biome is a large ge uh, geographical area characterized by certain types of plants and animals. A biome is defined as by a complex interaction of these plants and animals with climate, geology, rock formations, soil types, water resources, latitude, avid area. And there's a ton. And we're going to get into several different. We're going to kind of split it to terrestrials and then aquatic. Because there are two major things going on here on the planet. There's on land and under the sea, under the sea. I am not going to sing because I suck. Anyway, so tundra. So let's go ahead and start with the coldest. So we've got the tundra. And this is a treeless area between the ice caps and the tree line of Arctic regions. Um, they always have permanently frozen subsoil. It's called the permafrost and supporting low ground vegetation, such as lichens, mosses, and stunted shrubs. There's very little precipitation. A lot of the things that can live on here can live on these, these tough, tough little plants, like reindeer. Um, and so, yeah, very little precipitation. Now, if we go, uh, you know, warm up just a smidge and get some more uh, water in it, we get a taiga. This is a subarctic evergreen uh, carnivorous forests of subarctic lands covering vast no areas of North America, Eurasia. Um, this is what we kind of see up in Canada. Um, you also see it throughout like the Siberian uh, wilderness um, is taiga uh, in Russia. So it's located just south of the tundra and the coniferous forest, which is where we're at. We'll get to you in a minute. This is dominated by firs and spruces. It's also called the northern coniferous forest. So that's the taiga. So now we're moving into us. So this is kind of where Hendersonville is. We're in a temperate deciduous forest, but we're also kind of sticking a toe into tropical rainforest don't get into that in a minute it's actually we're we're in an interesting zone here in henderson excuse me so we have the northern and southern hemispheres latitude between, uh, below 50 degrees four distinct seasons that's one of our triple ah now i have the hiccups
anyway uh we have you know mild to average precipitation uh temperature uh, temper uh, temperature range from below freezing about 30 degrees celsius which is you know. now and that in the tropical rainforest which is basically uh tropical it's around the equator is usually where you find these guys very lush green plants and there's layers of vegetation we're going to get into that in a minute rainfall is a lot um very hot and humid greenhouse like um constant temp of around 25 degrees celsius now hendersonville and our mountains western north carolina is kind of an in-between zone for these two um we're as close to uh the united states getting a tropical rainforest as you can possibly get so we are in a cool in-between zone here in our mountains which is why we kind of get a lot more rainfall than you'd see elsewhere although we should be getting a lot more rainfall we've actually been in a semi-drought for a while now which is not good um which is actually why we get the, definitely the hot and humid summers and very humid winters which goes right through me i don't know what about wet cold but <laughs> anyway so we're kind of in an in-between zone so we're technically on paper we're a deciduous forest but because our area is so unique we're actually kind of in between a deciduous forest and a and a, and a rainforest so we're in kind of a cool in-between zone here, which is actually really, really cool and why we have a ton of different salamanders in our mountains and plants that you really don't see anywhere else. We, ha we have an interesting eclectic mix where North Carolina's uh, ecosystem is really interesting and that's actually why I like talking about certain parts. So anyway, grasslands, these are temperate and intemperate and tropical region, um, about 25 to 75 centimeters of rain a year, most have a dry season. This is where we get that rainy dry season thing going flip flop. Uh, extensive root systems called sod. I was talking about that back in the plant when I was talking about plants. We have the the huge root systems, and we tried to cut it all out because it was getting in the way of us planting out in the you know in the Midwest, and unfortunately that's how we caused the dust bowl. Yay, because we chopped it all out, and then the sand with the 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 dirt was so fine and we also had a really bad windstorms kick up the weather just decided to be horrendous so between the weather going ha ha oh monty just yawned hi monty yawned anyway so they make great farming areas if you can get the sod out and unfortunately though if the weather goes wrong then you've got dust everywhere and kills all your plants and everything so interesting ecosystem desert uh region so arid because of very little rainfall now keep in mind this is there are deserts that are cold and hot and sometimes they're both uh there's a lot of deserts where it's blistering during the day and freezing at night like the Gulby. um heck a lot of our deserts so it's so arid very little rainfall only sparse widely spaced vegetation or no vegetation at all less than 25 centimeters of rainfall per year it's usually covered in sand or gravel um a lot of really interesting adaptations from both plants and animals come out of these guys um we've tried some some different things too we actually uh the u.s army um around the time of civil war we actually had a camel core I'm not kidding you. We actually got a bunch of camels to get uh, uh, supplies back and forth across the American deserts. There was one that escaped with a dead guy strapped to it. The dead guy somehow mummified and it became the red terror of this one town or a bunch of towns out west. I'll try to put a link in here to an article about it. It's really weird. But they finally caught it and it was one of the camels from the army camel corps that somehow there was an army soldier tied to it and he was dead and mummified and everybody thought it was some kind of demon because <laughs> they only saw it the distance because the camel would run away and they were like what's that because they had ne a never seen a camel and b there was a dead guy strapped to it somehow it, it was during civil war era weird story someone red devil something i'll like i said i'll put the link here it's a weird weird story read it it's funky all right so now unlike minecraft where you literally know where you walk into another uh 
uh, system, uh, a lot of these these biomes actually gradually change into each other over large areas, stretches of land. So it isn't like you walk in and go, you know, like, I don't know how many of you have play, ever played Minecraft, but, you know, you're walking in and you hit the, uh, you know, the desert biome and you're like, oh, I'm in the desert biome. And then all of a sudden you're in the, you're in one of the uh, mushroom forest biome. And then you're like, oh, I'm in the mushroom forest biome. Now here, it, it, there's a gradual shift between the two biomes and that's called an ecotone. And there's also ve uh, vertical layers to biomes here in uh, uh, the land. And so it's kind of like a sandwich of vegetation. You know, you've got your layers, unlike a burrito where there should not be layers. Did anybody see that Reddit post? There was a Reddit post, somebody screwed up making a burrito and they literally made it into like layers. Like first was the guacamole, then was the rice, then was the meat, then and it was, and then was the cheese. And it's like, no, that's no, they need to be not like that. You don't want to just live in guacamole city and then suddenly he hit the cheese lands. You want it together. <laughs> we want it equal throughout, not in layers like that. Anyway, so uh, so from the top, we've got what's known as the emergent layer and then the canopy. Um, and then you got the lower tree area. And then you got the understory, which is basically, you know, darker because these guys are where all the sunlight is. Um and it's shielded a lot from the weather above. So that could be storming and raining up here. And it's actually, you know, pretty good place. It's a good nursery for young saplings. And then you got the forest floor where all the fun stuff is, like the bacteria, the fungus, and the insects. Watch out for army ants. You want something disturbing? Go watch a video on how fast army ants can completely and utterly dismember things that they just happen to run across. Never sleep on the ground floor. Always make yourself like a, a, a lifted bed off the ground, never sleep on the ground. Cause uh, in some places where army ants roam, you won't wake up because they'll have dismantled you by the, over the course of the evening. I'm not kidding you. They're, they're quick. They're quick and they're, where are you going Monty? No. All right. So um, there's also, a, uh, this is also the ground. The forest floor is also known as the litter layer cause all the litter from the, you know, the trees and everything plants above. And there's also that this doesn't have it but there's a root layer as well and the underground and that is also considered you know part of a biome so aquatic biomes basically there's three types overall you got your fresh water which is the standing water lakes and ponds moving water you've got your transitional which is estuaries this is the in-between of water and salt uh wetlands like bogs fens swamps and marshes like our mountains we're kind of we are swamp mountains. That's kind of why we're in between the two. It's kind of weird. Anyway, marine ecosystem, uh, shorelines, barrier islands, corals, reef, open ocean, which is fun in, in itself because that there's several up in there. So those are the three flavors overall of the ecosystems or biomes and water, freshwater, transitional, and marine. Now, freshwater. So basically, freshwater are characterized by a salt concentration of less than 1%. Um, very closely linked to the soils um, of terrestrial biomes because uh, the soil is basically what goes through and, you know, uh, filters a lot of uh, the water when it rains. And we get groundwater, which we're very much dependent on. Um, so uh, particular characteristics, uh, patterns of speed of water flow uh, with certain rivers. Um, actually, I need to tell you about the funness of... Um, the North Carolina DOT versus um, beavers. <laughs> and if we have time, I'll get into that. Uh, and the climate to which the uh, biome is exposed. Um, marine. So there are so many zones in this. Definitely go over this in your book because I wish I could spend more time on this but yeah there's a ton so characteristics largest biome covers three-fourths of the earth's surface and has layers itself most stable temperatures so temperatures are usually pretty stable but it's subdivided into regions going down so for instance you've got the top which is known as the photic zone or the um or the uh, sunlight zone we also got you know 
uh, shallower areas like the neuritic zone and the intertidal zone. So this is where the tides are coming in and out, in and out. And that's its own biome in itself right there. Uh, this is where you find a lot of coral reefs and everything, photic zone. Then you go down. And then the first zone you pretty much hit is the pelagic zone. So it's getting darker. Um, you don't have any plants really pretty much pelagic down. If you do, they're they're not exactly photosynthetic plants. They're actually not, not, not. Then you get the ap, ap photo zone. So A photo, mean no light, no light, a benthic zone sliding on down. Um, and then you go down into the midnight zone, and then you can go into the actual uh, trenches, which is called the trench zone. Um, and each zone because there's just from the photic zone pretty much down there's like no there is no h2o going on so a lot of the life is hanging out at the bottom next to those vents i was talking about because there they can get nutrients and then they can get oxygen coming out of those vents and um only the big boys can go the distance which is why you find you know whales and whatnot so it just depends on what's going on. Now, food chains and webs, holy cow. So it's easier to talk about food chains and webs on terrestrial biomes than it is in aquatic biomes. They are insane. Like they're like, you need a 3D model to go for uh, water biomes. Water biomes are like way more complicated instead of, you know, Sun makes sun makes grass, grass grows, cow eats grass, we eat cow. Lion eats us. I don't know. I just threw a lion in there for reasons. Anyway, um, and then fungi break us down. So that's basically a food web. That's a very or a food chain. It's very basic. So, you know, basically a food web is a food chain that has many overlaps. For instance, usually everything is based on the sun because the sun is used by a producer which is a plant and then it's eaten by a first level consumer which is an herbivore or an omnivore um uh, omnivore means we can eat both that's what we humans are uh which is eaten by a second level consumer which is a carnivore or an omnivore and then finally you know dying death and decay is returned all that uh stuff is returned to the soil through a decomposer which is usually bacteria or fungi um and Basically, all the energy is really on the producer level. The energy goes down by like levels of one hundreds. I mean, that's why, you know, predators have to eat so much constantly because they're not getting a lot of food out of the producer level. So all the energy is really on the producer level in an ecosystem. And that's why if the producers are not producing enough, you will not see this these next couple of levels at all because they can't be they can't be supported. So the producers most of the energy is right here. These guys get first dibs on that, but these guys the reason they have to hunt all the time and eat all the time is because they're not getting a lot of that energy because it had to go through the first level consumer and it goes down every step of the way. And then by the time you know lion eats cow he's not getting as much nutrients as cow does from grass. So it's, it's kind of interesting there. Um, so anyway, there is some math to this. We're going to get into it in the future. I'm not, I'm just touching on it right now. I'm not going to go into it crazy much right now. So most of the energy in the food was available to the producer level, which is the largest and it supports everything. It's like a pyramid. It's not like the food. It's, it's, it's the life pyramid, not the food pyramid, the food pyramid. You know, they had to fix that. They made it a wheel now. Mm. Anyway, but as you can see, you know, food web is basically a food chain going every which way. You know, because more than one creature can eat rats. You know, some birds eat rats. Some foxes eat rats. You know, all, all the way around, you know, the rat might eat the puffins eggs here all this fun stuff so more than one predator per prey item Did somebody knock or am i just hearing somebody drop something okay i'll get into this in a minute oh i think we're done the last 38 episodes of yes we are cool all right so there we go um 
I'm hopefully going to turn this into an interactive HV5 for you tonight, hopefully. But anyway, so there you go. So there is ecology, uh, intro to ecology in a nutshell. Next up, we're going to be talking about population ecology and doing a bit of math. Yep, the math has appeared. Math has appeared in science. So I will see you then. Uh, so yeah, take it easy. And I hope, I hope both this one and the next lecture will hopefully be up by Wednesday. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So with that said, I'll talk to you in just a minute.